This is Microeconomics Lecture Number 15 on Market Failure. Let's learn some economics. Now, first of all, we want to define what we mean by market failure. Market failure is kind of a combination of a couple of things, and they're interrelated. Markets fail to achieve socially efficient levels of output and to achieve economic efficiency. And we'll go through both of those again. Uh, we've dealt with economic efficiency, and it is related, kind of, so the socially efficient level of output is rather related to this. Uh, now, there are four types of market failure that we're going to look at. The first of them, and perhaps the most frequent of them, is the inefficiency created by imperfect markets. Okay, now we'll recap, uh, briefly anyways, the idea of economic efficiency. First, we have allocative efficiency, which is where price equals the minimum marginal cost. Okay, what this ultimately means in a conceptual sense is that society is paying as much, which is the price, as it costs society to produce the product. And so there's no excess. Uh, and then we have productive efficiency, which is price equals minimum average total cost, which is a little simpler to understand. It means the producer is producing it for the least cost. Um, most of our focus is going to be on uh, allocative efficiency uh, in terms of socially optimal uh, levels of output. Um, then we're going to look at the provision of public goods. With the provision of public goods, we're going to define what we mean by public good uh, when we get there uh, and define what the major problem is and what it gets down to in a nutshell with public goods is public goods are goods that are non-exclusionary. Okay, In other words, you can't prohibit someone from using it. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, a lake at a public park. You can't exclude people from using it. Okay, or uh, a street light. Um, you can't exclude someone from enjoying the, the illumination that it gives. Well, the problem is then that there are certain people who are enjoying the access and enjoying the benefit that comes off of the public good without necessarily paying for it. It's what we refer to as the free rider problem. Uh, then we have negative externalities. Negative externalities are simple to understand. Uh, and the negative external externality is a cost borne by a party, a third party, not directly involved in the production or consumption of a unit. Uh, the classic example of a negative externality is pollution of various and sundry sorts. Okay, uh, and we'll get to those. We'll 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 hold off the the lengthier discussion until we get to that. And then finally, one that we've already looked at: shortages and surpluses. Shortages where too few goods are produced, surpluses where too many goods are produced, and what causes this, okay, beyond what we talk about with imperfect markets and public goods. First, let's look at imperfect markets and economic efficiency. And again, we recap economic efficiency here. The price equals the marginal cost, okay, which means that society is paying for the good, money out, as much as society, as much as it costs society to produce an additional unit of that good, which is marginal cost. Okay. Uh, now, productive efficiency uh, is where P equals the minimum average total cost. We've talked about before where the producer is producing at the lowest level. Now, here's where we start from a theoretical basis. We know from our previous discussion of imperfect markets, meaning anything from monopolistic competition to monopoly, that the price is greater than the marginal revenue. Now, follow out the, the, the logic here, and it's, there, there's, it's a mathematical consistency, okay, that flows from it logically. Efficiency is where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. If the price is greater than marginal revenue, therefore, price will be greater than marginal cost. That's the transitive property from mathematics. Okay? Uh, and this is what's going to create the, the inefficiency. And so as a result of that, what it means is that too little output is going to be produced. And we'll see why that's the case here in just a second. First, let's deal with perfect competition, which is the original model we looked at way many weeks ago. The first thing you notice here is where I equate marginal cost and supply. We remember 
that the supply curve is the cost curve beyond the point where marginal cost and average total cost are the same thing. Okay, that would be the y-intercept. We learned that before, uh, if you can recall. And so the marginal cost curve and the supply curve are the same. That's why they look alike. When we when we originally introduced the supply curve, uh, we didn't go into the lengthier explanation. Once we got into production functions, we talked about the relationship of the cost curve and supply curves. Okay, so we have our basic model here, and here's the demand curve. Now we remember that in perfect competition, demand. Uh, is the same as, as marginal revenue. There's no difference between them. It's not till we get to imperfect markets that the marginal revenue curve becomes different than the demand curve. In fact, it becomes one half the demand curve, or another way of phrasing that is that the slope of the marginal revenue curve is twice the slope of the, of the demand curve. And so demand slopes down like this. The marginal revenue curve in an imperfect market would slope down like this uh, and lead to a very different production output for profit maximization. And then we had, here's the price of equilibrium in a competitive market, the quantity of equilibrium in a competitive market. Now, what this means, this is how much it costs society to produce one additional item of the product. This is how much it costs, so, or, or how much society is paying uh, for one additional unit of the product. And so here we see that the price that society is paying for one additional unit of the product is equal to uh, the cost society bears of producing one additional item. And so we have economic efficiency. We now look at an imperfect market, and this is a model that we've looked at before. We just want to discuss the market failure that comes from it and introduce the idea of a deadweight loss. And so just by way of review or by way of recap, we look at this, okay? Here is the point, what we remember is what this is predicated on, is that in an imperfect market, price and marginal revenue, which is to say demand and marginal revenue, are not the same thing. Price is greater than marginal revenue. We learned that when we dealt with imperfect markets. That's why I place such an emphasis on it when we learned that, okay, because it becomes critically important to future discussions, one of which is now in imperfect, in, in, in eco, uh, economic inefficiency uh, and imperfect markets, okay? Well, because of this, the marginal revenue curve, as we said, is twice the slope of the demand curve, or another way of thinking about it is that it's one half the demand curve. Here's our demand curve, therefore here's our marginal revenue curve. Well, the profit maximizing decision for our imperfect competitor uh, is the same as for our perfect competitor. You want to produce where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. That's how you're going to reach a profit maximizing level of output. That point is right here where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. To determine the price for that output, we go up to the demand curve. We find that the quantity IC, which is the quantity of imperfect competition, okay, for that number of units, the price will be the price of imperfect competition right here. Okay, this is the price that demanders, consumers, are willing to pay for that many units. And based on what we originally studied way long ago on the law of demand, the lower the price, the more the demand. Which is to say, the greater amount of output, the lower the price uh, that, they will, that they will pay for it. Okay. Uh, the fewer the items, the higher the price that they'll pay for it. And so because production is lower in an imperfectly competitive market, price is going to be higher. And we've talked about all this before. One of my objectives is just to give you, uh, you know, uh, a dozen different ways of phrasing this so that one of them will kind of lock into your cerebral cortex there for you to remember. All right. Now, as a result of that, you have a suboptimal output. We, we just now and before discussed the idea of economic efficiency. Economic efficiency, this is the price that society is paying, or this is the cost to society, I should say, of producing another unit. Okay? In a perfectly competitive environment, this would be the price they pay 
uh, for that additional unit, in which case price would equal marginal cost. But because m price is greater than marginal revenue in an imperfectly competitive market, it follows that price will be greater than the marginal cost. The marginal cost of producing this many units is this point right here, okay, where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. The price for which society will pay for each of those additional units is up here, okay? And so price is greater than marginal cost at that production level. And of course, the question you ask yourselves is, well, why wouldn't they produce at the, at the socially optimal level? where you have perfect economic efficiency because this is profit maximization. The, the individual producer doesn't care a whit about a socially optimal level of production. They don't care at all about economic efficiency in an allocative sense. They care about it in a productive sense, but not in an allocative sense. What they care about, what our producer cares about, is profit maximization. This ultimately flows as an extrapolated point from the law of supply. The more you give me, the more I'll produce. Okay? That's not entirely the case here. Profit maximization. Okay? And what we see is as they, as, as the price goes up, they'll produce more along this cost curve. All right. So I want this to stick in your head, and I'll phrase it again and again and again, different ways, so that you want, and whichever one locks in your cortex the best, that's the one to stick with, because they're all synonymous. They're all different ways of phrasing the same thing. All right? Now, let's look at a few things as a result of that, and it's been a, a, a relatively long half-mester that we've been going through here, uh, and so I'm not going to require you to do the actual calculations and at a higher level microeconomics class, either at the graduate level or at the level of microeconomics too, we deal with this, okay? We talked about consumer surplus. Here is the consumer surplus derived from this imperfectly competitive market, okay? Because marginal revenue is marginal cost right here. They're going to, the, the producer will produce QIC units. The price of those units, in other words, the price that consumers are willing to pay for that many units is PIC, all right? And so the consumer surplus, and we always want to remember what consumer surplus is. Consumer surplus is the difference between <coughs> how much a consumer is willing to pay for a product and how much they actually pay for that product for as many units of that product as they buy, okay? And it's actually, we, we calculated this previously, it's this triangular space right here. Profit, on the other hand, is going to be revenue minus cost, which is what we've looked at before. Well, here's our cost curve. Any production above this cost curve, any prices above this cost curve, okay, that's going to be profit per unit. And so our profit is going to be two areas here. This rectangular area, which is above the cost curve, and this triangular area above the cost curve, okay? And what we could do if we wanted to have some fun, and maybe I will throw it in for extra credit this last week, is figure out exactly how much this profit would be and how much the consumer surplus would be, and then this is the deadweight loss, Okay, this deadweight loss is both a function of the unused capacity and the artificially high price charged in the imperfect market. Okay, so it's a combination of those two things. Now let's just take a look. I'll use the laser pointer here. Just take a look. If it were a perfectly competitive market, such that marginal revenue and demand are the same thing, or to say marginal revenue and price are the same thing, the price would be right here. Okay. So this triangular space then would be consumer surplus, and this triangular space would be profit. That's what we dealt with before, in which case there's no deadweight loss. The deadweight loss is created because of the reduced production level in an imperfect market and the increased price level that is the result of that reduced production. That's what's going to create your deadweight loss, which is this triangular space right here.
And we've gone through this before, and we'll go through it again. What we mean by deadweight loss, what it means is that society is paying more for the product, that's the price, than it is costing society to produce an additional unit of that product, the marginal cost. And we saw that in the previous graph. Price is greater than marginal cost. That's the economic inefficiency. Okay, And that's caused as the result of, it's, it's ultimately caused because of the resu result, or it also ultimately is caused by unused capacity. To maximize profits, the profit maximizing level of output, okay, is less than the socially optimal level of output. And this is because marginal revenue and price are not the same thing in an imperfectly competitive market. Okay? And so ceterum parabus, which means all other things being equal, the greater the difference between marginal cost and price, the greater the deadweight loss. Okay? Uh, and we call the difference between marginal cost and price the markup. We've thought about markups before. Okay? Markup is the difference between what it costs you for the item uh, and what you pay for the item. In, a, in, a, in the sense of the producer, it's the difference between the cost of producing the item and how much they charge for the item. All right? On to public goods. And this is a, a, a kind of a, a more difficult thing to think about. Not really more difficult. I don't know why I would say that. It's a, it's a different thing to think about, all right? The, there, are th there are really three defining features of a public good, two of which we look at here and one of which we'll look at in a minute. First of all, they are non-rivalrous, which means the use of it by one person does not preclude the use of it by another consumer. An example of this, a public road, the road outside of your house, okay, the road outside of my house, is a public good. If I drive on that road, it does not deny another consumer from driving on that road. Okay. Now we can we can bring this to 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 its 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 fullest extended conclusion and say, well, that's true and that's not true because at any one moment in time when I'm driving on a road, my automobile occupies one particular space of that road. At that point in time, that particular space for that moment in time as I'm driving along is, not, is rivalrous. No one else can occupy that space at that moment in time. If they try to, we have an automobile accident. Okay, That's a little bit of an absurd extension of the idea. What we're talking about is when you're driving along the road, it doesn't deny other people the right to drive along that same road. So it's non-rivalrous. Okay. Uh, we have we have other non-rivalrous uh, things. This is one of the defining features of a public good. If you look, for example, at another public good, which is to say maybe a law enforcement officer, a policeman, okay, well, the policeman can sit there in their car watching traffic go by, and the fact that the policeman is watching me doesn't deny him the ability to watch others as well, and so it's a non-rivalrous product. Now, the other thing is that it's non-exclusionary, meaning that you cannot prohibit the use of it from, for some but not for others. In other words, you can't make it so that some can use it and others can't use it. Okay? Uh, and so the classic example of this is the lighthouse. If you look at a lighthouse off the coast of Maine or, or Massachusetts or California, okay, you can't stop a passing by boat from seeing that lighthouse. Okay? It's non-exclusionary. A street lamp is the same way. A public road is something we need to think about because for the most part, roads are non-exclusionary. There's no way to prohibit people from using it. That's not entirely true though, is it? If you look at a turnpike, putting up a toll booth makes it exclusionary. And so in a sense, we can, you see, because if, if we can figure a way of excluding people from using the product, then it's no longer a public good. Okay? Another example of a non-exclusionary product is something like national defense. Okay? The United States military 
is an organization that defends the security interests of the American people. You can't deny their defense of the security of some Americans and not deny it to other Americans. In other words, you can't tell the U.S. military there are certain people that you don't need to defend. They're going to defend everyone. A missile system is going is a public good. It's going to defend everyone that is a potential target. Okay? Um, all right. Now, the market difficulty that flows from this that we'll look at in detail here in a minute is that you you have a tendency markets for public goods have a tendency to have a suboptimal production and this is because of something we know is the free rider problem which we're going to talk about and I want to lock it in your mind and it's something that's easy to lock in your mind because I'm guaranteeing you that every single one of you at some point in time has experienced a free rider problem. In a nutshell, what we're going to mean by it, and I'm going to define it again and again as I've done throughout, okay? What we mean is someone getting something for which they do not pay. That's a free rider. They get the benefit without doing the work. Let's, let's look at the demand for public goods, okay? The, and this was those third things. I said there are three basic aspects of a public good that make it problematic in terms of economic efficiency, in terms of the production of a socially optimal level of production, okay? And here we're not really worrying as much about profit maximization for the producer, okay? We can think about that, and we can extend that, but a lot of public goods are created or produced by governments for the reasons that we're going to get into because of this free rider problem, okay? Well, government isn't concerned with profit maximization, and we'll deal with that in the, in the following lecture, lecture number 16, which closes down our class on microeconomics. What we worry about here is the third of these aspects. We had the product is non-rivalrous, meaning that the use of it by one person doesn't preclude its use by another person. Okay, that's a public good. Uh, and that's why, for example, a grilled cheese sandwich is not a public good. Because if I eat the grilled cheese sandwich, that precludes someone else from eating the grilled cheese sandwich. And so it's not a public good. And you can rally to mind now goods which are public and goods which are not public. Okay, uh... It is non-exclusionary, meaning you can't stop some people from using it and allow others to use it. Okay, well the third of those conditions is that an individual consumer's demand for the good is lower than the marginal cost of what the good uh, costs to produce. An example, a surface-to-air missile system. A surface-to-air missile system costs millions of dollars. Now, as a citizen, as a consumer, I value a surface-to-air missile system. It defends me against incoming aerial-borne targets, okay? And yet, a surface-to-air missile system costs millions of dollars. That's well beyond my capacity to pay for it, okay? So my individual demand, now my individual, let's, let's go all the way back to the demand curve. What does the demand function show? What does it say? It says the amount that I am willing to pay for the product, okay, that's my y-intercept. That's the maximum I'm willing to pay for the product. Well, it is well beyond my means to pay for a surface-to-air missile system, okay, as it is well beyond my means to pay for a public road, okay? This is that time when we're all starting to think about public roads. Okay, because this is that we've entered into the second season in Pennsylvania. Seasons in Pennsylvania of the year fall into two general categories. There is the non-road work season and there is the road work season. Okay, they're doing road work all over the place. They just paved part of Adams Street. I live in Rochester Township and they just paved part of Adams Street. Okay, even the simple paving of that road is beyond my capacity. That section of that road is beyond, it probably cost them maybe five or six thousand dollars to pave that little section 
Okay? That's beyond my capacity to pay as an individual consumer. Okay? So now let's look at individual amount. The amount an individual consumer is willing to pay for one additional unit of a product. So we're back to marginal analysis. We're looking at how much I'm willing to pay for one additional unit as opposed to how much one additional unit costs. Now, let's look at an example. Let's look at our example of let's 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 use it as streetlights and and I, I absolutely have to give credit where credit is due. A lot of these examples I come up with on my own and I could have here, but there's a really good example in a book by Bay and Prince uh, that we use for managerial economics uh, uh, that I decided just to borrow it from there and some of the graphics I borrowed as well. Um, let's suppose that the individual demand for a streetlight light is 30 minus Q. Now what does that mean? When we deal with individual demand this Q is always going to be 1 because what we're dealing with is the amount that I am willing to pay for one additional unit of the product which is Q. Okay so if we say that it's 0 I'm willing to pay 30 for an additional unit. Right? All right. That's the maximum amount. Now let's suppose that a street light, the marginal cost, how much it costs to produce one additional street light is $54. Well, that's beyond my capacity to pay. Okay? And so as a result, there will be no street lights. Because all of we're gonna we're gonna assume here that all individual demand for the street light is the same. We all value it the same. Now let's look at this. Let's suppose we have three consumers, me and two of my neighbors, all of whom we all want streetlights. Well, the demand function then for streetlights, for this public good, okay, is going to be the summation of all of the individual demand functions, which we're assuming here are identical. And that means three of us, each of whom have the same demand function, 30 minus Q. Well, that means that the overall demand for the three of us is 90 minus 3Q. You can see now that this is going to be greater than the marginal cost of producing a streetlight. Now let's look and find out the socially optimal level of production. What is the socially optimal number of streetlights for the three of us? It will be ultimately the same thinking we used on profit maximization. Now, before getting into it, let's adjust our thinking a little bit on what we mean by profit. Normally, when we think of profit, we think of revenue minus cost. But let's adjust our thinking a little bit and think of, instead of thinking of it as revenue, think of it as benefit. We may not be trying to maximize revenue in a dollars and cents way, okay, in terms of monetary, but we are trying to maximize our profit in terms of benefit. We want to get the most benefit for the least cost, and so we're going to apply the same thinking that we did for profit maximization, meaning marginal revenue equals marginal cost, okay? Well, we're dealing here, we're assuming a perfectly competitive market, meaning that marginal revenue and demand are the same thing. And so our marginal revenue function is going to be the same as our demand function, 90 minus 3Q. We set that equal to the marginal cost, the cost of producing one additional item. We go through the math and we find that the socially optimal level of production of streetlights, the socially optimal amount is 12 for the three of us. Okay, so we want 12 street lights on our street. Okay. If now, again back to marginal analysis, the three of us divide that marginal cost between us. The cost of an additional light is $54. Okay, we are willing to pay 30. When we collect our and pool our resources together for this public good, we split the cost of each additional street light three ways between the three of us, which is to say we each pay $18 for each street light. 
okay? That's the idea of individual demand. That's why we're back to marginal analysis. What we're dealing with is the amount that I individually am willing to pay for a streetlight or for a public good more generally, and the cost of producing one additional unit of that public good, in this case, a streetlight, okay? Uh, and so ultimately then, the streetlights cost $54 each. Because there's three of us splitting that marginal cost, we're each paying $18. That's well within our demand function. And given my individual demand, the maximum I'm willing to pay for a streetlight uh, for one additional streetlight is $30. Here I have to pay $18. Now let's look at what this looks like graphically. Okay, With the three of us all splitting the marginal cost, we pay $18 each. From our individual command curves, we're willing to pay 30. Hence, each of us is going to obtain a consumer surplus. That's going to be shown by this green blue area here. Okay, we're each, This is our individual demand function. This is our collective demand function. Okay, And it will always look like this because the Q in an individual demand function is always going to be 1 because we're dealing with the amount that I'm willing to pay for one additional unit of the product. All right? And so we get a certain consumer surplus. Now, we learned before that very simply consumer surplus is the difference between the amount that I am willing to pay for the product, here $30, and the amount I actually have to pay for the product, here $18. And so I get this $12 in consumer surplus for 12 units. Now, you see here that it's actually this triangular space as we dealt with before, and so it's going to be one half of this space, okay, which is 30 minus 18, 12, one half of that is 6, times 12 units, we get $72 in consumer surplus, all right, this, the, the shaded blue area right here, all right. Now let's take a look at the problem, and this is the free rider problem. This is based on the non-exclusionary nature of the public good. In this case, the example we're using are streetlights. We can't stop someone from enjoying the benefits of our streetlights. Would-be passers-by, visitors to our neighborhood, they get the benefits of our illumination. Okay, If we deal with it with other public goods, like a police force, they get they get the benefit of our police force. Our police force extends, you know, wanderers who drive through our community the same way it protects us. Okay, uh, that's why I always think police forces should specially target people who aren't from the neighborhood. Like you should have a little sticker on your car that has your address, so they know you're from their neighborhood. Uh, so that they might cut you some slack on things, uh, but they don't do that. No. I get targeted the same way that 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 uh, strangers uh, passing through Rochester get targeted, but that's okay. All right. And so now let's take a look at our example. Let's suppose that one of the consumers, we had three consumers, A, B, and C. Let's suppose one of our consumers, let's say A, okay, lies. They decide that to to hide their actual demand for streetlights. Instead, what they say is. I don't need the streetlights. I don't care if it's dark on the streets. I don't need them. Okay? My demand for them is zero. I'm not willing to pay anything for it. Okay? What we're going to have then is the achievement of a suboptimal level of production. Okay? And I mentioned to you that all of you have experienced free rider problems. There's a reason in my class. Okay? In none of my classes do I ever have students do a group project. If you've ever done a group project, you have undoubtedly run into a free rider problem. Most, the way most group projects are created is that everyone in the group gets the same grade, meaning they all get the same benefit, regardless of the amount of work that they put in. They may evenly distribute the workload. They may instead, most of the time it says, okay, here's the group project. You guys distribute the workload uh, among yourselves. And then we sit there and we distribute the workload among ourselves, but we always have one POTS 
who actually is probably smarter than the rest of us, is why they, this goes on, who realizes that since we're all getting the same grade, they don't have to do any work at all because everyone is interested in getting a good grade. And so if they don't do any work at all and slack off, other people will pick up the slack because their grade is dependent upon it. Okay? In other words, back to our streetlight example, we all want illuminated streets because illuminated streets are safer, they're safer to drive on, they are a deterrent to crime, etc., whatever. Okay? So we all benefit from them. We know that. We know that each of us wants the benefit from that. So because I know that the others want the benefit, why would I do this? I had a situation like this when I went to Georgetown University in 1989. From 1989 to 90, I was in, at Georgetown University in the Master of Arts of Arab Studies. Okay? And I lived in a house with seven people. One of whom was one of these very anal people who could not stand to have an unclean kitchen, particularly with dirty dishes. And so for a year, I didn't have to do a dish because I knew they would do it. I valued, I valued having a clean kitchen. I valued having no dishes in the sink. But I knew they did too. And I knew they valued it every bit as much as I did, if not more. And so I knew that if they saw dirty dishes in the sink, they'd clean them. And so I didn't have to clean anything. All right? This is the ultimate f problem with a free rider. They're going, because of the non-exclusionary nature of the good, clean dishes in the sink. Okay? They are going to be able to enjoy the benefit without necessarily having to pay the cost of doing it. All right? Now let's look at what happens as a result of that. We're back to our individual demand function, okay? Each of us individually demands streetlights according to this function, 30 minus Q. But now, because A, one of our neighbors, has misrepresented their demand for the public good and said that they don't value it at all, there's only two of us, and so our summational demand is 60 minus 2Q rather than 90 minus 2Q. What does this mean? Well, it is going to corrupt, okay? It's going to skew the optimal number of streetlights that we calculate because we're going to set this demand function the summational demand function, which at this stage now is 60 minus 2Q, equal to 54. Well, that means that we're going to come up with an optimal number of streetlights of 3, rather than the 12 we came up with before when we had all three consumers' demands, all three individual demands in the function. Okay, so because of this, consumers B and C will obtain less consumer surplus, and A will obtain much more because they are free riding. Okay, enjoying the marginal benefit of the streetlights without having to pay for them. Now let's look at how much more they're going to get. This is the same graph we looked at before, except now, again, we predicate this again on marginal analysis. All right, before we determined an optimal number of streetlights being 12. The optimal amount of the public good was 12. How did we get that? We, we, we summed the individual demand curves together to come up with that summational demand curve, that overall demand curve. We set that equal to marginal cost, and that gave us our optimal output, just as it did with profit maximization. Only now we're dealing with benefit rather than revenue. Okay? The, maximum be the way we're going to maximize benefit for the cost okay, is by producing 12 streetlights. Okay, now at that point, we say, okay, the marginal cost of a streetlight is 54. There are three of us paying for it. We each pay $18, and so we got the consumer surplus that we identified before, $72. Okay, the difference from 30 to the triangular, so that triangular space we looked at from 30 to 18 up to 12 units. All right, well, now let's look at it. Because A has misrepresented their individual demand for a streetlight, it's now just me and C. I'm putting myself in the in the in the guise of B here. It's just me and C buying it. Okay, B and C are now the only two splitting the cost. 
because those two are now splitting the cost of each individual street light, they're paying $27 a piece for the street lights. Okay, this significantly reduces their consumer surplus. It's still within their individual demand function. Remember, their individual demand function was 30 minus Q. So it's still within their individual demand function. All right. And so they're now going to produce three units and they're going to experience this consumer surplus. This area here will now be the new consumer surplus for B and C, which is to say this triangular space which is 30 minus 27 is 3, take a half of that and that's 1.5, multiplied by the 3 units. You get a dollar and a half in consumer surplus uh, for each of 3 units, you get 4.5 dollars in consumer surplus instead of 72 dollars. So A has really screwed us here, okay? Whereas, look at that, now let's look at A. A's consumer surplus from free riding is the same as this entire space here. They're paying absolutely nothing for the three units. How we'll calculate their, their consumer surplus is this triangular space plus this rectangular space. Well, the triangular space we just figured out was four and a half. And then the rectangular space is zero, the amount they're paying for the streetlights, to 27 multiplied by three, which is 81. So they get 85.50 in consumer surplus we both get 450 in consumer surplus. This gives A an incentive to free ride. All right? Now, the logical extension of that is a regression. Each of us knows this. We each know that the others value streetlights. They value the public good. They value police forces. They value a national defense force. They value a public road. They value a good grade on a group project. We all know this, okay? And so we know that they value it. We know that we will do better, okay, if we free ride. It is always better to get the benefit with no cost than it is to get the benefit with some cost. We know this. This is rational actor modeling. One of the things we originally introduced way back when in week one was the idea that economic actors are rational. And this is why I say those slackers who slack off on group projects or who don't f pay their fair share okay, with, with public goods, they're actually smarter than the rest of us. They're more rational. It's a more rational play. Okay? I face zero cost and get the same benefit as everyone else. Because of this logic, everyone is going to think the same way. And if everyone thinks the same way, they will all seek to free ride and there will be no public good. What if everyone in a group project put this thinking to work? the group project would never get done. That typically happens. I have students complain about that all the time, that they've got a group of four people working on a project together, and three of them have come to the rational conclusion, and so all the work gets done by one person, and the other three free ride, or two of them will free ride. Same thing happens in local communities. You get this all the time, okay? People don't pay their school tax. They don't pay their property tax. When they don't pay their school tax, they don't pay their property tax, we can't stop their children from going to school. We can't stop okay, them from using public roads and the police force and the fire department. Okay, One of the things I, that always irritates the hell out of me is I have no children. Okay, I have no school-aged children. My two stepdaughters are both adults. And yet, I have to pay school tax. Why? Okay, a lot of people feel that way. That doesn't make any sense. Now we could we could go into a to a lengthy discussion of that, but we won't. Okay, it's to my benefit. It's to society's benefit to have an educated society. Blah 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 blah. Eventually they'll go to work. They'll get good jobs. They'll be able to pay taxes. That'll reduce my taxes, etc. Whatever. Okay. And so this free rider problem is the serious problem in public good. Now, how do we resolve this free rider problem? How can we, for us to resolve the free rider problem, we have to resolve one of two issues. Either one, 
we have to figure out a way of making the good exclusionary. Making it so uh, some people can use it and some people can't use it. Like, for example, we look at the records and if somebody hasn't paid their school taxes, we send their kid home. Their kid shows up for school and we say, sorry, your parents are deadbeats. They haven't paid their property tax. They haven't paid their school tax. So get the hell out of here. You can't do that because state law mandate, mandates that they that they have access to a public education. Okay? It, we we can't do it with public roads. Okay? If they if they if they haven't paid their taxes and therefore are not paying their fair share for the maintenance of the public road, we can't stop them from driving on it. Okay? It would be nice if we could somehow and with technology the way it is, we should be able to have we have record of everybody that hasn't paid their property tax. We should have a computer system that would be linked to the computers, the, 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 the central computer in their car, okay, the central processing unit of the computer in their car, so that when they drove their car onto the public road, our computer system would know, it would cross-reference and see that they haven't paid their taxes, and then it would shut down their CPU in their car, and their car would just stop moving, and they would be stuck there. That would be nice to do. We might be reaching a point where we can actually do something like that. Okay? So you have to figure out, or, 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 you have to find a way of forcing everyone to pay their fair share. One way of doing this, have the government provide the public good. The government then can force everyone to pay their fair share in terms of taxes. We'll deal with that a little bit more when we deal with them with the microeconomy of government. On to negative externalities. Okay? A negative externality is any cost borne by a third party who is not directly involved in the production and or consumption of an item. I'll give you an example. Okay, examples abound. Almost always they deal with pollution. Pollution is your primary externality. There are others we're going to look at in the next lecture on the microeconomy of government that are considered externalities, such as minority discrimination in, in the workplace. Okay? We'll look at it here as pollution. And let's let's look at one that's not often looked at. Let's think about noise pollution. Okay? Suppose I have a house that's right next to a concert venue, okay? Like the, what is it they call it now, the Post-Gazette Pavilion or something like that, what used to be called the Star Lake Amphitheater. Let's suppose I live in that neighborhood, right next door, okay? I'm not producing the concert. I'm not going to the concert, okay? I am in no way associated with this consumer-producer relationship, and yet I have to pay a cost. I have to pay the cost of hearing the blaring music in my house, okay, some of which I don't like, okay, I have to pay the cost of, I mean, let's face it, we've all been, most of us, I think, probably all of us have been to rock and or roll concerts, and we know that what rock and or roll concerts are filled with is drunken people. And so at the end of the concert, here come all these drunken people wandering out of the concert, being loud, throwing their trash on my yard, okay? Maybe they're too drunk to drive and they end up turfing my yard and hitting my automobile. This actually comes from not a personal experience. This is from my brother's experience. My brother and his friend went to a concert one time, and they were both so boozed up afterwards that after my brother had dropped his friend off, he took a corner too tight uh, and ended up going into somebody's yard and this isn't funny at all and ended up plowing into the guy's car and flipping it over actually and my brother was able to drive away yeah i know i know i know that's a negative externality that that guy experienced okay the question is what economic efficiency does this create and how do we correct for it okay and it's basically very simple to understand Our profit maximization calculation, the profit maximizing level of output, and the price we charge is predicated on the idea of marginal cost equals marginal revenue. Right? That's We've been dealt with that 
all the way since I think the second or third week of this half semester, we've dealt with that. Well, with a negative externality, the marginal cost is higher because when we do that calculation, what we're calculating is only internal costs. The costs that we looked at when we looked at the cost functions, okay? We're looking at the price of our labor, the price of our inputs, the, the price of our facilities. That's the marginal cost we're looking at. Not so much the price of the facilities, that's a fixed cost in the short run. But in the, if we extend it to the long run, then it would include that as well. But principally the price of our labor, the price of our inputs, etc. Okay, those are internal costs. All of our profit maximization calculations have been based solely on those internal costs. Well, a negative externality adds an external cost to society. Okay, what we're looking at when we deal with economic efficiency in terms of allocative efficiency is the price for which society, the price at which society buys an additional unit of the product the price versus the amount that it costs society to produce an additional item. Up till now, we've been thinking of the cost to society of producing an additional item as the internal costs, cost of labor and the inputs, etc. But now we add to it also the cost of the externality, okay, which is not included in those internal costs. That's going to increase the marginal cost. In other words, for example, the example we used, a concert. Well, the cost to society of producing that concert is not simply the cost of the band and the venue and all of the various vendors and all the good stuff that goes into it in internal costs. It's also the noise pollution, okay, and the waste pollution that's created from that. We have to include that in the cost somehow. What that's going to do is drive up the marginal cost. Okay, now let's take a look at what that does. All right, here is our internal cost. That's our labor and our inputs and all the things we've been dealing with in terms of our profit maximizing level of output. Here's the demand, which is to say the price. And so price equals marginal cost at this point. And so we produce QE1. Now we add to this some negative externality. Let's suppose this is in an industry where pollution takes place. Let's suppose uh, the production of fertilizer. Okay, the production of chemical fertilizers. Okay, well, part of the byproduct of that production process is toxic chemicals. Well, the creation of those toxic chemicals forces a cost onto society. You're polluting. You're poisoning the environment. That drives up the marginal cost, okay? So we have this is the marginal cost of the internal costs plus the external cost of society. You see what that does. That drives up the marginal cost. When it drives up the marginal cost, that means demand is going to be less, production will go down, our profit maximizing level of production will be less than it is when we deal only with internal costs. And again, what we're dealing with, this is one of those competitive things. As a producer, I don't care a whit about, uh, about, about the socially optimal anything. What I'm interested in is maximizing my profit in an economic sense. I'm not interested in the other things. All right? Now, one of the things that Robert Morris is on the cutting edge of is what's known as sustainable economics. Okay? Sustainable economics deals with including external costs, negative externalities, in the production process. Okay? And what, what we show in sustainable economics is that over multiple iterations of the game, over a lengthy period of time, in the long run, the benefit to society is actually maximized by including the marginal cost of production and including the negative externality and producing at a lower level. In the long run, actually producers will maximize their profit more if they do that. 
We won't deal with that now. That's for a course on sustainable economics, which they do in fact offer here at Robert Morris, and I heartily encourage you to take that course. Uh, for now, we just want a basic understanding of this. Okay? And so what this ends up with is kind of exactly the opposite of the inefficiency of an imperfect market. If you remember in an imperfect market, because marginal revenue is less than price, they ended up producing a less than socially optimal level of production. <coughs> and this was the basis of the economic inefficiency and the basis of the creation of the deadweight loss. Well, now we have the opposite. Because we're not including the external costs of the negative externality, the producer is producing too much of the unit, okay? The, 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 the cost to society is actually less when you deal with only the internal costs than it actually is when you include the external costs to society. Society is paying too little for the product here. Before, with the imperfect market, society was paying for an individual unit of the product more than it was costing society to produce an, an additional unit. Well, here, exactly the opposite is the case. Here, society is paying less for an, an additional unit of the product than it actually costs society to produce the product when you include the external costs of the externality. And that's the distinction here that I go over between the imperfectly competitive market and the negative externality. And you see, this is what I was just saying, is that in an imperfectly competitive market, society, the price, the amount that society pays for an additional unit of the product is greater than what it costs society to produce an additional unit of the product. Here, exactly the opposite is the case, because you're not including the negative or the external costs. Okay, the price is actually too low. You need to include those those external costs, those externalities, which will raise the marginal cost and bring it closer to the point where price equals marginal cost. Finally, we'll deal with shortages and surpluses, which we've done with what dealt with before. Okay, the now let's just kind of to recap the cause of 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 the the inefficiency when negative externalities are, are concerned, is the failure to include the additional cost of the external cost, the additional cost of the externality, in your marginal cost calculation, in your profit maximizing calculations. Okay, With imperfect markets, it was because marginal revenue is less than price. With public goods, it was because of the problem of uh, exclusion and not being able to exclude some and not others from enjoying the benefits from the product and from the free rider problem. Okay, well here the cause of the shortages and surpluses is within the free market itself and is caused by information problems. Okay, failure to accurately assess market conditions, either incomplete, imperfect, or asymmetrical information. We'll lump those all together. Okay? So, for example, if a producer perceives that demand is greater than it actually is, they'll produce more. They'll produce a supra-optimal amount, in, meaning more than optimal. Okay? And you'll have a surplus. If the producer perceives that there's less demand, than there actually is, they'll produce too little of the product, okay? And that's what we talked about before is the market has a self-correcting mechanism for this, okay, called the invisible hand. Now, how the invisible hand works, we see here in this graph, and we've looked at this before, uh, we're now just kind of collating it all together. If the producer perceives that there's more demand than there, than there actually is. This is our actual demand curve. If the producer perceives instead that the demand is way up here, they've inaccurately assessed the market, they'll produce too much at a, at a price that is too high, okay, up here. Well, the result of that is that the market itself will force a reduction in prices back to an equilibrium point. And you see that summarized here. 
Perceived demand is greater than actual demand. That yields a surplus. Dropping price reduces supply to meet actual demand curve. The exact opposite is here with the demand function, okay? And that's the invisible hand. And so with shortages and surpluses, the reason for the economic inefficiency, the reason for either the supraoptimal production, which is greater than societally optimal amounts, or the insufficient suboptimal production uh, is because of a lack of accurately assessing the market, a lack of information on markets. To recap everything and to conclude, okay, we discussed all market failure based on inefficiency. With imperfect markets, too little is produced, okay? The, the price that society pays for each additional unit of a product is greater than what it costs society to produce that individual unit. So price is greater than marginal cost. With public goods, since we can't exclude the free rider, there's too little output. Ultimately, the logical extension of the free rider problem is that none of the public good will be produced at all because they are all rational actors, and all of them realize that by free riding, they will get something for nothing, in a nutshell. Okay? With negative externalities, we saw exactly the opposite of imperfect markets. We saw that because the external cost of society is not included in our profit-maximizing output level, too much is produced. In other words, society is paying too little for each additional unit. It's paying less for each in additional unit than it costs them to produce the additional unit when you include the external costs, those externalities. And when shortages and surpluses, too little or too much is created because of incomplete or inaccurate information regarding the markets. That concludes uh, our discussion of market failure. Uh, and we'll move on for our final discussion of microeconomics on government uh, the, in the microeconomy.